opening of May 18th, 2022, Clear Roxbury Board of Directors meeting at 631. Um, okay. Um, so, first order of public comment. Any public comment? No? Any on the on the screen? Uh, looks like we have Zach on the screen. Uh, yeah, so I don't see any members of the public. Oh, sorry. No, no <laughs> um, great. Uh, I have a motion to approve the consent agenda. I'll move to approve the consent agenda. I'd like to pull the superintendent's report and the June 1 um, draft agenda, please. Do you have a second? I second. All's in favor? Aye. Uh, Any opposed? Um, yeah, you want to talk about the. The, which two do you pull? The draft agenda for 6-1 and the superintendent? Just those two. Draft agenda of June 1 and superintendent's report. Okay, report. Okay, not the evaluation. Um, I just wanted to say thank you, Libby, for sharing with us how, uh, once again, how tough it's been, and also for a snapshot into what you're preparing for, you know, what you're using to prepare for, um, uh, and the focus on community building um, and, you know, bringing everybody back together. Uh, I just think it's, I think it's so important. So I just, I just wanted to say thanks. And I think it's also important for us as the board and for the community, you know, the hundreds of people who read the superintendent support report as part of our board packet um, to also know uh, just how difficult it has been, it's not necessarily because there's much we can do about it, although always, this is once again, you know, anything, anything that we can do, please let us know. But also just, I think it's helpful for us to have that awareness so that we can contribute to trying to make things better in any interaction that we do have with teachers and administrators. And so it's helpful. It's really helpful. Thank you. Um, the June 1 agenda, I just had some uh, an idea that maybe it looked like the board discussion section was a little light, um, and I thought it could be a use of, a good use of time for us to prep for the retreat, which is yep. happening on the 13th, uh, yeah. yep. if we haven't already thought of that. And then, That's great. Um, I also just wanted to confirm that we are having a board meeting on the 15th as well, even though the retreat is on the 13th because the retreat really is making up for not having July meetings or, uh, yeah. Typically it's replacement. Typically it's replacement. Okay. Um, Libby and I were not able to have a regular meeting Friday, which is okay. light. I, I don't know, what's the general sense of the board? Do we feel like we want a meeting on Wednesday after Monday? My vote would be probably not. <laughs> um, but if people are just itching hard for it, I'm happy to do it. We'll, I, we'll met on Monday. Amanda? I feel like we should have it June 15th and whatever we don't finish. The retreat's always not, in, like we always have things that we don't do afterwards. So we could just use that time to finish whatever it is that we didn't finish from the retreat. Um, there's always work that we could do together. I, I feel like since we're not having a meeting in July, we can advance some of these conversations um, that I'm hoping we get to on the retreat, but also probably not. <laughs> so I think we should have it. Uh, um, and we, are, we are not meeting in July. Not meeting July. <clears throat> uh, one thing comes to mind that's on the June 15 agenda, which is the transportation discussion and okay. talking about yeah. Roxbury tra uh, transportation. Mm. So. That is one, especially if we're not meeting in July and we'll have an opportunity to reschedule that. Okay. Yeah, to see us continue okay. with the let's, June 15 meeting. Let's have it though. Let's try to make it 
two hours or less. So, so it would be June 15th and no meeting on 30th on in July? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. That sounds good. And I just had one other thing that is sort of, it's maybe like I'm, well, I have a little bit of a preamble and I'm a little nervous about this. So I, I wrote a little script for myself. Um, my other folks on the board, if you're, if you scroll through the Facebook page, like I do from time to time and community members um, might have seen that the event that was advertised as a learning session um, around teaching about racism in our schools. Um, and spoiler alert for those who didn't see it, whoever was at the head of this session is not in favor of teaching about racism and the hard truths of our country in our schools. And um, it was supposed to happen last Friday in Montpelier and another one on Saturday in Williston. Um, I, I don't know if they actually occurred or not. Um, to be perfectly honest, one of my defense mechanisms around these things is to pretend that they are not happening. <laughs> Um, but I also know if that that's not very helpful. Um, and so I thought a lot about what perhaps we could do as a board, particularly because there is some sort of, well, it's connected to education. Um, and I would like to offer that, I think, a statement in support of our teachers and particularly in support of teaching hard things um, would be somewhat useful from the board. I don't find, you know, statements to always be particularly, you know, they sometimes are basically to help us feel good. But I do think that for, that anytime we can make a statement in support of our teachers in particular, it's a good idea. And uh, so that's a suggestion that I have for the board um, to maybe also have on the June 1st agenda. And I would be happy to draft one for us to discuss on June 1st. I don't think that any of us is prepared to have that conversation today. And I don't want to derail today's agenda with it. Um, and another idea that I had is to volunteer the equity committee to take a little bit of time at one of our upcoming meetings to figure out how to use this as a learning opportunity for our entire community. Not necessarily, I'm not just thinking about teachers are in our schools, but parents were engaged in the, con or caregivers were engaged in the conversation on Facebook and it was supposed to be happening in our town. Um, so it feels like an opportunity to engage the community at the as a learning moment. So it could be something that the equity committee discusses on, discusses how to do that and maybe we come up with something. So I just wanted to see, you know, mention that and see what folks thought about having that be something part of the conversation at the next board meeting. Um, Wait, you look like Amanda Mither. Is that a discussion? Should we have, is that? Well, are we having a discussion about it or just, I, I, I thought a lot about statements and I don't like them, um, especially, you know, last, last year we did a great statement around the um, APIDA community, uh, but it was also on the same like there was some active work that was happening in the school, in the high school specifically with the TA. There was like the RJA really did organize something that students had discussion in their classroom. Um, so it was accompanied by a series of things that the Rich Justice Alliance was also doing. Um, so I think that if it's just for the statement, I just don't think that. I think we should be looking at our policies. We should be looking at how do we strengthen the curriculum? How do we, you know, supporting the teachers, yes, uh, to teach the hard histories, but there's also some inequities around curriculum that we've talked about it a couple of times already um, that I'm sure teachers are working hard to kind of listen to the students. But I, I just always think that statements is not at this point of the game in, our, in the racial justice community is just performative and I think we should be looking more into what can we do to advance some of these policies in our equity policy and other policies that can come to mind to strengthen that work within the racial justice whether the uh, you know supporting the librarians supporting all of that um, in more concrete ways but I appreciate you bringing that up uh, Mia. 
Yeah, I, I get that, Amanda. Thanks. I appreciate you bringing it up as well, and I did speak up flyer, and you spoke about it at the, uh, my place of employment, Vermont Higher Education Collaborative, of like, so what do we do? And I know there's a discussion among other organizations about like, do we respond to this? How do we, you know, and, and there's this fine line of like, uh, this work does not reflect the values of our community. You know, the work that, the message that they're trying to spread <laughs> is, um, and my greatest hope for that event was that they came to Montpelier and um, had a pretty empty space. And I think that's that our district living its principles and our, uh, you know, teachers delving into tough topics uh, with the support of the community, I think that's sort of the best response. But I also agree with Amanda that we could take a, a harder look at some of our policies and just see like, one of the policies that came to mind too was the actual um, event rental space. <laughs> like if, so, if some, a group comes in and wants to rent a space, you know, there's the freedom of speech thing, but it's like, what do we do when somebody comes in and wants to, wants to host an event like that in our district space um, that doesn't align with our values or our policies? Um, so I'd like to sort of take a look at, at that end of things, and I would welcome the discussion on an agenda. Um, that's a tricky discussion. When we get into yes. free speech things, like we can't- Discriminate. We can't discriminate. Yep. And, and also I think part of what we should teach is that part of being in a civic society is being able to tolerate opinions that you don't Never. agree with, that you find offensive, that you find obnoxious. <laughs> Um, and being able to deal with those in an open forum and, and have discussions and um, not have a knee-jerk reaction to shut them down. And, and that's one of the things that I was thinking about when I talked about if the equity committee could put a little bit of time into thinking how to use this as a learning opportunity yeah. around that. Yeah. Um, and, and there is a discussion between hate speech and freedom of speech, which are two different things. And um, you could argue that too, in freedom of speech, there's not, you know, we can't tolerate somebody calling, using the N word in a space like ours. So like, there is a big difference. So there's not, it's, it's yeah, it's a whole conversation around hate speech and freedom of speech and how, what do we, we allowed. That doesn't mean that I'm, yeah, I'm not gonna allow, yeah. So it's a it's a conversation. And there's it's outside of this too, and it's national, and there's lawyers involved, and there's so I think that we also have to just look up the big context around some of the policies and laws that are also being passed in the state and in some of the districts. Thank you, Madam. Um, so I think we need to approve the thing with those two, and we can. Um, maybe, maybe you can send some suggestions about how to deal with this on the June 1st agenda. I could, yeah, we can right. do a little thing. Yeah. So um, I move to approve the uh, superintendent's report and the June 1st draft agenda. Um, do you have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So the next item is uh, Zach and Merrick's student update. Right. Do you need to broadcast? Yeah, we got that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so stop yeah. loving, loving the. All right, so Zach is going first on the first time. Um, could it be, I mean, could it be screencasted to Zoom? I don't know if y'all can see it, but. Zach, we had to do a little different setup this, this time around. Do you have the presentation in front of you? I have it up for the board members. I have it, so I can, I just, if that was easier. But yes, um, thank you. So this is our agenda. Um, and what we're gonna cover in our update, um, some of the things are going to be events at MHS that uh, are upcoming, um, that are currently happening and recently happened, um, sort of a community update. Um, we also wanted to uh, bring into 
thoughts, some student needs that were brought up um, in previous listening sessions to sort of um, remind ourselves and the board sort of what the community is wanting as well as current issues um, for students. And then we're just, we're gonna give our upcoming plans update. All right, so let's get into some kind of events that have been going on at NHS. Uh, the first event that occurred at NHS from May 5th to May 7th was the All State Music Festival. And this was an event where high school students applied and were accepted into this festival where they could showcase their musical talents. And so from MHS, we had 10 students who were accepted to the program and they performed from May 5th through 7th. Congratulations to them. And then, and then we have um, prom is happening this weekend. Um, there have been a lot of students and staff who have been working, coordinating um, all the things needed to do a fun event. Um, and it's gonna be, it's gonna be good. Our last little update was that this week, the applied chemistry class has been selling soap in the front lobby of the high school. And it looks like Libby has seen it. Um, <laughs> Always get me some soap. <laughs> yeah, so it's kind of just a little promotion. If any of you want to buy some, the last sale to buy the soap is tomorrow. So feel free to stop by. They're there pretty much the whole day. Yeah. 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 That is an awesome picture. <laughs> Good stuff, so yeah. <laughs> Um, and then we wanted to, here's our student needs, um, a refresher on sort of what's been going on in the past, some of the things that have been brought up, which are still current issues, um, but we heard them in the past. So that's why, why, that's why they're in that category. Um, so uh, concerns were about uh, awareness and flexibility within classes surrounding the mental health of students, especially with COVID. Um, I think a thing that students have been pushing for a lot is, um, or at least that I've heard, have been um, teacher and course evaluations to um, just as like a standard for all the classes so they can give feedback in a way that isn't like intimidating or like very, isn't scary. Um, and there still have been problems within curriculum that we've been talking about um regarding a lack of diversity and either ignorance or just like not knowing how to address microaggressions when they happen within the classroom um if it's from student to student or even from student to teacher um, and sort of around that and around mental health um there was a lot of um wanting to build into teachers like plans and like their their minds um that for really heavy topics especially if it's like um in form of like a video or some like documentary um alternative spaces should be given for students um and they should be warned about that a few days in advance or like a day before um so it's not they don't have to make that decision whether or not they can deal with that sort of content sort of in the moment right before it's going to happen because um, that can be really difficult and then <laughs> some current student concerns are still um, the parking lot i know work is being done on that and we all we all know about the parking lot problem um but that has been a thing i heard when i sort of asked um what people are feeling, what's going on for them. And then a recent thing was uh, on two of the three multi-stall bathrooms in the high school, the doors, the outside doors were removed, sort of leading into, um, leading into the room with the stalls. Um, and there was an explanation given essentially that it was like to prevent bad behavior from students or like there was something happening that like wasn't okay um, from a group of students. But 
everyone is affected by that sort of um everyone is affected by that and um there's been a lot of talk about students feeling unsafe um and sort of like vulnerable um in like a, in a way they didn't know was sort of possible um, because it wouldn't have some, been something they imagined happening. Um, and I've heard from both faculty and students that it's like kind of weird and uncomfortable um, to just have like a, a place be so open to the outside. Um, and um, a lot of the single stall bathrooms are like always in use now and um, because everyone's uncomfortable in the multi-stall ones and that means a lot of the problems that were happening in the multi-stall ones are now happening in the single stall ones and also people who are uncomfortable being in that environment of like a multi-stall bathroom um, which would is made worse by the door now lo no longer have that option of like as a direct result um and like i know personally it's been it's been a little a little not fun it's been a, a little uncomfortable to like be in school and have to like navigate that um yeah so that was that was a current student concern that i heard a lot when i asked people I just wanted to add real quick on the student concerns, and I, I've said it in the past few meetings, but in bringing these concerns to the board, we're not recommending or saying that the board should take action on any of these concerns that we heard, but we are, we did want, we do want to bring them up to the board and to the community to show that they are on the radar of students. And yes, I've also heard all these concerns and continue to hear all these concerns. So, so, um, Moving forward, our upcoming plans are going to be, as, as student representatives, to be continuing to bring awareness to these student concerns through these board meetings and through these presentations, and also just by continuing to reach out to students, continuing to hold listening sessions at UES and RVS, as well as continue researching, as we spoke about at our last few meetings, how we can approach the, our, the, our schools' curriculum and instruction with the with the goal with the goals that we heard from student concerns over our past two listening sessions like how can we improve that curriculum or that instruction so those are our upcoming plans um, i don't know if anyone has any questions for us but that is our presentation for today thank you when we were getting our building tour of the facilities we got a building tour of high school and we um, sort of briefly discussed the parking lot issues is the main issue that that students are concerned about is the number of parking spaces available well, to them or so the main issue is that there aren't enough parking spaces in the high school right so that's causing just students to park in sometimes awkward places like the handicap spots or just parking spots that aren't supposed to be where cars park. Yeah. So there's just like a huge sprawl of cars in, in a parking lot that cannot support all of them. And have, do you know if there's, I know that um, Meg uh, Bojan, is that how you pronounce her name? Yeah. Was at that facilities tour and she's part of the earth group and they were talking about like having brainstorming sessions with students to talk about like incentivizing, you know, or somehow changing the culture around driving to school. And I wonder if that there could be some brainstorming session, you know, hosted to, you know, there could be some of the ideas were like, if you carpool, you get better parking spots or something like that. Or yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> right. So A permit, permits for seniors or things like that. So those discussions about potential parking solutions, they took place in student council at, our, at the high school and also in Earth Group. And some of the solutions that were discussed was more emphasis on carpooling, especially more emphasis on other forms of transportation like bikes. But um, since those discussions, there hasn't really been any action. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and those are the exact type of things that in, a, in achieving net zero, like 
building more apartment spaces is very much moving in the opposite direction. So right. there should be it's like it should definitely. be solutions more aligned with carbon right. reduction. It, it's certainly difficult, and it seems the easiest solution is to encourage more carpooling, but yeah. then there has to actually be action on that for any difference to take place. Feet and bikes are good too. Yeah. <laughs> but I know what'd you say, Jim? Feet and bikes are good too. Yeah. I know that um, there's talk of next year instituting parking permits at the high school to hopefully cut down on the car sprawl in the parking lot. So. I would also wonder if the Earth Group has ever reached out to, I guess it's Green Mountain Transit in terms of you know accessing. I don't, I'm not familiar with all the routes in Montpelier, but you know, organizing a meeting with GMT and having them come. And, Students having the opportunity to be like, what does it mean to ride the bus? What does it mean to get a ticket on the bus? I mean, public transportation can be really intimidating if you haven't experienced it before or used it before. So it seems like possibly it could be another option if there's a route that goes by the school. Montpelier has on demand busing right. um, that works kind of for students and kind of not for students. Mm -hmm. They can call and just get a ride. Mm -hmm. um, it does not work for all students, but it's also free. There is no, mm -hmm. there is no payment for it right now it won't be free forever and the district has already worked with gmt to get bus passes for everybody so mm -hmm. when it's not free then we, we will pick up the tap for any student but it's not it doesn't work it doesn't work in a way that we need it to work right now the on-demand so, bus yeah option. yeah or it doesn't they work just, the way uh, we need it to work. and then green mountain just approved free for next year so doesn't now it's continues to be free until 2023. They so, just uh, approved that today, or like this. Also, one more thing about potential busing. Student Council did have someone from my ride who actually came to one of our meetings and talked about potentially encouraging students to use my ride when going to school, but there wasn't really much action after that meeting. So, but we did have those discussions. Mm -hmm. I have one little add on, which is another and sort of what's happening in the schools announcement, just for those folks who don't have elementary school students themselves, but the um, revamped book fair, the UES Loves Books Week um, is in conjunction, is next week, and it's in conjunction with Bear Pond. Um, so I can share the link out once we have all of that, but it's not just for families at UES, anybody in the district can, can do it. and. Um, uh, in, and part of the th cool thing you can do is um, teachers will have wish lists for their classrooms. And so you can, even if you're not looking for a book yourself, you can um, buy a book to uh, donate to the classroom. So anyway, another what's happening in our schools. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Okay. Um, any more questions for American Zach? Great. Yeah, thanks again. These thanks. are great. It really helps keep us the better pulse on what's happening in the schools. Um, Mr. Barry, I think you're up. Yeah. Okay. And I don't know where it's best for you to. Uh, yeah, wherever, wherever is easiest for you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm Mr. Barry. I'm the Snapshot and try to answer as many questions as I can about it. Um, so the annual swap snapshot is an online tool that the AOE produces, and it's used to measure what Vermont schools are doing well, what they've changed since the previous year, it helps us see how schools are supporting achievement, shows a holistic view of school quality and all of these components. It's made up of these three areas, which are the domains, so you see there, there's a little blurry up there. We've got academic proficiency, personalization, safe and healthy schools, high quality staffing and investment priorities. And then there are the metrics that they use, which are gonna be the fun things to explain. And then you see the, the ratings down there, you get the, the little circle for the uh, not achieving, the full circle for achieving, things like that. The answer to this video was when, um, the latest education law came into being, states had to decide how they were going to assess schools out of a certain list. So in Vermont chose these. 
these are all the elements that make up the snapshot. And I'll go through them because I know it's blurry here and if you have a presentation in front of you. So for the, this domain up here, academic proficiency, they use the English language arts. This is the SBAC assessment. Um, and the scale, that's a scale 50%. That's the scale score of the assessment. So it's a raw number that we get from the assessment. And the growth is a comparison of that student's growth from the previous year. It becomes a problem when you don't assess much. Um, math comes from SBAC. English learner proficiency comes from the VITA assessment, which is our PL language assessment. That's given. Graduation rate is, is there. The science assessment comes from the Vermont Science Assessment. College and Career Ready, those are actually components of ACT and SAT scores. And then post graduation is 16 months post graduation, where students are. And I'll talk about that some more in a second. In the second domain, personalization, they use the flexible pathways measurements that's pretty much what comes right now from that all three of those are kind of flexible pathways uh, high quality staffing they use the licenses and endorsement information state goals uh, three-year turnover rates professional development um, satisfaction and evaluation data and I'll, I'll talk about all of these in a bit safe and healthy schools up in the right hand corner there is disciplinary exclusions and then they mentioned two school climate components and then investment priorities is financial financial basis per, per people cost and there's a bit of staffing ratios in there and if you go to the next slide everywhere there's a check mark the data was impacted in some way the green top one Green represents anything that was impacted by COVID. The red, those are measurements that were not used at all in producing this year's snapshot. So things like, oh, that was the post-graduation. So when I talked to the, the Agency of Education about how they collect that data, they admitted that they're having a significantly hard time getting that data. Um, you know, part of it is uh, military, during, you know, students that are that are enrolled in the military after 16 months, um, employers, things like that, you know, they're having a hard time tracking students other than college now. And even then, they're having trouble assessing that 16 months out from graduation. So I put a little asterisk there to say it wasn't necessarily impacted by COVID. They're not necessarily not taking it, but not really talking about it. All questions to the end or ask the first one. Uh, you can wait till the end and we'll do it back So, this slide, this query slide here, this represents the equity index, which I asked a ton of questions of the AOE. And Patrick Halliday, I'll, I'll shout out to him, he's been really helpful and at the same time doesn't really have a lot of answers about how the equity index is created. But um, so the equity index refers to the difference between students who have been historically marginalized. And down here, it shows those categories in a comparison to students who have not across all those other areas that I just showed you. Now, there's, there's a, I have a technical manual here that I've read several times, and I just took a stats class, so I feel really confident about my abilities to decipher this. Still really hard to understand. If a marginalized group, let's say that a marginalized group represented by five students, that may not be enough to calculate the equity index in their form. If it's 25 students, and that same 25 students were here the year prior, it may work in the equity index calculation. But if you go back a slide, back, all of these were impacted by COVID. So the number of students that took the SBAC exam impacted number of students that took the Vermont science, impact. Number of students that took the SAT and the ACT, impact. Because this data that you're seeing on the snapshot this year is based on last year. So flexible pathways, we had fewer places we could place kids during COVID times. So flexible pathways were impacted. Professional licenses, we had a lot of um, provisional licenses and we're hiring staff. They didn't do the staff stability Report. They didn't do anything with professional development. They didn't do anything with evaluation. 
they didn't do school climate surveys, they didn't do student climate surveys, and our staffing rates were all askew because we had lesser positions and things that we normally wouldn't have. So all of these were impacted in producing this year's snapshot. So the AOE, even on the snapshot page at the top, there's a disclaimer that basically says, please don't use this for anything other than a glance. And you know, Patrick Halliday, he's doing a great job. What he says is that we're hoping to have some sessions in the coming years to really unpack how the snapshot works, work with curriculum directors in particular to understand the metrics within it. And I think this is my opinion, not what I heard from the AOE. I think they're kind of restarting the process that this year because they lost a year's worth of data because they didn't get the assessments in 1920. So I think that they're looking at this as a chance to, okay, this is our year one, and this entire machine works on a three year average. So we don't have three years yet running straight. So there's a huge disclaimer. This talks about you know the, the impact of COVID. So for example, we had a total of 118 students that were virtual last year that could take the assessment. 57 did not take it. We had a total of 548 students in the whole district, including virtual, that could take the assessment. 81 did not take it. That's 15% of our whole population. So those, those, all of those things that are measured in the snapshot are impacted by that in a pretty big way. So there's, there's several things that the AOE put out to, to mention that. And they say at the top, you know, this is used for reporting, not accountability. So that means that if there were things that we were doing really, really wrong, they recognize that they can't tell that from this data. That there were supports that we needed in things like that. So this is Roxbury's um, snapshot. And there's a couple of things to point out on here. So one, is that if it's less than 25 kids, they can't report on it in any one of those categories. So that's why there's no academic proficiency data there because there weren't more than 25 students in Roxbury that took the SAC assessment. Same with personalization. Um, I found out an interesting thing about these metrics. So down here where it says investment priorities. Yeah, yeah. Roxbury would never have any personalization if it's things like flexible pathways should yes right because they don't deal with right sorry so an interesting thing about this so investment priorities it says not meeting that's if you're below or above okay so since this is a per pupil cost it's showing that Roxbury is above and that's why they're not meeting so the not meeting is a little deceptive and that that works on these other categories the change columns, essentially, we need to ignore uh, because it's comparing against data that is not accurate from the previous year. Hopefully next year, when we see the snapshot compared to this year, it'll be more accurate. But all of those change categories just aren't, aren't even there right now. And the investment priorities is only based on staffing ratios. So union, kind of the same story there. The same thing stood out. Um, the one thing that was different here was the high quality staffing exceeding. And then it says that we're going down. So we're exceeding, but we're actually declining, which was a conflict. But we think that that was because of the increased number of provisional slots. Main Street Middle School. Same things to point out there. And the high school got a little more personalization, flexible pathways information came in there. There's a little bit more information. And then this slide actually shows how, how we did do on the SBAC assessment on the left hand side. So this represents only the students that took it. So it doesn't represent the 81 that did not have received the girl. That's not factored into this. 
that's a whole rabbit hole there. Um, so we had 65% proficient ELA, 45% proficient in math, and then 56% proficient in science of the students themselves. And so where do we go from here? Well, I'm not saying that the, the snapshot isn't important. I think it will be a valuable tool. I think this year is not the year that it's, it's super valuable to be one. Um, but I think it's going to be one of those tools that they're going to refine. It's going to help when we understand the metrics and can explain how the data is harvested, then we'll be able to really use it. But a lot of this information came from data that we already have. So we, we know where we need to go. We need to really focus on those tier three structure systems and interventions for the students to need remediation and intensive support. We're doing a lot of work on that right now. We need to continue our focus on restorative practices. We have improved data systems. That's pretty much my geek zone I'm living in. Um, increasing student voice, focus on staff wellness, and then the PLCs continue to be a, a big need, um, especially as we move into next year with our brand new administrative team and uh, a bunch of new teachers as well. Uh, this is the time to really build up those practices. How do we or start that crowd the, the proficient or the blue and the green? Mm -hmm. So, um, how accurate do you think the data you get from SFAX really is? Because I know a lot of students who don't take them all that seriously in what they do. It depends on what you're looking for. So if we're looking for a 30,000 foot view of how the students are doing, I think there's some accuracy to it. If you're looking for really minute details about how one student did and what was going on, you can dig into it. And you can see, so if we took the SBAC assessment and compared it to something else that we knew the student did really well, and we, if we saw that discrepancy, we could understand what happened. Um, and for the students that do take it seriously, we can dig a little bit deeper but it doesn't give us a lot of the actionable information that people think it does in terms of tailoring that student's instruction. Um, it can, we can see trends. So for example, um, there's, Libby and I disagree on this a little bit, but there's this, there's this learning targets within the next time. So we can look at it and say, you know, wow, it looks like our students are really doing well in vocabulary acquisition. Whereas I think if you ask people, a lot of people would assume, well, we need to focus on vocabulary. We need to focus more on vocabulary. But we actually see a trend where our students are doing quite well. And so you can kind of see it. It's not super specific. Um, the math is a little better. So we can get a little more specific on that. But the ELA is the one that I think is a little bit fudgy. And then the science is still kind of a new assessment. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're trying to understand that one as we go. Great question. I actually think it's more important to problem though that it's not being that specific. What mindset do students have when they go into something not wanting to do their best? That is a bigger problem to me than the score I messed up. There's just a lot of stress for us to do when it comes to taking these like, very long tests. So I think that students don't really want to do well because of that reason and also just. I mean, I can't really speak to all the reasons why students don't take their tests super seriously, like for SBACs, but it probably also, another factor is probably that they know that it doesn't really matter for like their grades. So they're so that, as a result that less likely to. So many other questions around uh, why we learn for me, that, right. you know, like we don't learn for grades. So that they're just that just opens up so many more questions that I think are worthwhile to dig into. Um, and based on our scores at the higher levels, our scores at the higher levels are actually pretty good um, when you compare them to the state. So I'm not positive how many kids actually do that or not. Right. You know? um, my question is also related to this. Or one of my questions is related to this slide. Um, and sort of your point about like 
how um, relevant is the data, but I do think it's relevant when you compare it to other things like Libby's talking about, like compare it to statewide, because I'm guessing sort of the number of kids, the percentage of kids that sort of are like, this doesn't apply to me, it's not making a direct, are, is probably similar across the board in most states and at least in Vermont, in most schools. So I think you could at least compare it that way. Is that available online? Like those bars, can you see yeah. our school district versus the state? Yeah. And can you also see our state, our school district versus the country? Or is it just, this is just, country. so this is, this not is every just- state takes the SBACs. Yeah, so you can see other states that take the SBACs? Uh, Vermont Agency of Education site, so you it's can just see our, our school district versus the state. Uh, there's like data, interactive data tool. I don't know about finding the results for the states that are in the consortium, but probably those. I have a context question. Um, so, is this, are we doing this in part because it's required? Because it sounds like if you hit certain marks, it can be tied to funding or kind of categorization that would yield funding. So, I'm just curious, you know, because it also sounds like it's, its value is yet to be fully yeah. manifested or seen or known. So are you talking about the, when you say it, you mean the annual snapshot or yes. the I'm No, annual snapshot. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because there was a, there was something and I said that like, you know, we're not going to be really treating this as true data this year. So it's not going to be tied to, I forget what it was like. Accountability. Equity. Yeah. So I'm just curious, you know, is it required and is that why we're doing it? And, you know, and have we ever received any, you know, state support based on our results here? So, yes, it's required. OK, we, yeah. yeah. Well, the state makes this. State we don't make right. this. Right, they all. make yeah. the platform, yeah, yeah. yeah. but yeah. we need to do it in terms of the accountability. I mean, are they looking at this to? All the data, except for on that checkmark page, there's mm -hmm. a couple of points there that we don't collect. Like, we, I don't think we hold information where students are 16 months out. Mm -hmm. So they, there's a couple of points on there that they have to get from other sources that sounds like they're struggling with. The rest of that information um, lives in the state. So the SBAC results live in the state, or at least it's the information in the state. So they're accessing their own systems to pull this report together. Um, so we never really submit anything to this, mm -hmm. other than our annual SLPS update. Um, so, and then tech supports, we don't necessarily understand what those look like. They're there. We do not follow back. Yeah. I just want to let other people ask questions first before I speak again. Sorry. Go for okay. it. Yeah, Very polite. Yeah. Very polite. <laughs> I, I didn't see any of any, uh, their arms. Um, the, okay, so the, the Safe Healthy Schools measure. Mm -hmm was only the only data they used for that if i understand correctly on slide four is disciplinary exclusion yeah can you explain exactly what that means first of all the number of students that were suspended ah okay That's That's it. It. and expelled and expelled yeah so if i'm reading this right then okay so so all schools are exceeding is that right? But, yes. and, that, and what is that measured against? It's just like there's a certain number or percentage of exclusions <laughs> that sort of rises to the level of concern. Not sure. A, A we, didn't, we didn't have any data in that category last year. Oh, so it's like zero. Right. So they're like, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> You're yeah. exceeding across the okay. And allegedly, somehow, you know, that data is also parsed through demographics and comparisons from previous years, but they didn't have that data from previous years. And last year was an anomaly in almost every way in terms of data collection. So, yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. One is to make sure that we're understanding, again, with the caveats you have said, that when we look at the academic proficiency in at 
Union, Main Street, and Montpelier, kind of the non the non equity index is meeting, but then the equity index shows not meeting. So what we could surmise from that is that the students that are in those historically marginalized communities are not meeting whatever the standard of academic proficiency is. No. Okay. Good. No. Okay. I don't, I don't think we can see that. Okay. This year, I think that's ultimately how the tool, the tool works. Okay. But not this year. Okay. Um, because there's, there, as far as I understand, there's two metrics at play in there. One is the number of the category of marginalized population, the total number of students that fall into that category right. of the, there is a list that of five. List. Yep. Right. Then there is a comparison of that group to their non marginalized peers. Right. But only if there is a certain number in that marginalized in group. Both. Right. Right. And they don't take that whole list as an aggregate. Where they they are they taking the each individual group on that list as a I see. Yeah. Right. Even okay. One student. Yep. Um, that's that's my understanding of it. Okay. Um, and so you know, I'm talking to the AOE. And, and they again they plastered it all over the site like the change menus and the equity index like hold on not really digging into that this okay. year. I think what we'll see as we get a three year average, we get to that three year point. I think this tool will be much more accurate. We have consistent data over three years with those groups, right? And then they'll also work into that. I believe the the so the change comparison or the Things like academic proficiency are based on that student's scores for three years. So did they improve each year? So that cohort of students in the marginalized group would also have that metric. They just don't have it. Right. Okay. Having said that, though, we know that our students who are eligible for free and reduced lunch and are eligible for an IEP do not perform yeah. where their peers do right. and not marginalized groups. We, we know that. But well, that gets into what I think you were saying about course, like this snapshot is only so good, but then when we use it in conjunction with other tools that we have, it helps give us the information that we really need. And it seems to me that at least for a while at our in our district, our numbers in some of those categories of communities are still going to be pretty small. Yes. And so, and this is one of the challenges that we've had. And I know we can't see Amanda right now, but maybe she's got her hand raised. But yeah, she does. One thing, <laughs> one thing that she's shared with me is that one thing we could look at, even though it's not our district, is the whole state. Mm -hmm. So that would be another way that we could use this this tool as a, a benefit to us is okay. even if we don't have the volume or the numbers, the quantity numbers that we need, we could still look at statewide numbers using this tool and say, okay, well, we can probably surmise that our students that are in these categories are probably performing same as their peers, all you know, statewide. And so that will give us some data that we can use again in conjunction with other tools Maybe. that we have. That's a big assumption. That okay. I'm not, I don't know if I'm comfortable making for okay. all categories. Uh, I, I just don't feel comfortable making that for all categories. Okay. I think for, I think uh, being eligible for free and reduced lunch has a, that probably we can make that assumption because national research bears that. I, I think we can make that assumption. I'm not positive that we could make that assumption for um, kids who are BIPOC, for instance, in our school district. I'm just not positive we could make that assumption. We could maybe. But I don't know if it's a safe one to make. Is there a way to <clears throat> dig underneath that where we could say that's not enough information for us, but we can go to something else that is more about our district and to well, we can do confirm with, or deny? Like um, kids who are who fall in the BIPOC category, we can we can get that data. We can't share it publicly in many cases by grade level because they're not enough kids. Yeah. Right, it has to be eleven for us to be able to share data with the board at a public event, right? Yeah. But we could take an aggregate, probably, maybe for some categories <laughs> of the whole, all the kids who take the SBAC, right? It just can't be, you know. In future years, we'll break the SBAC scores up. Here's how our third graders did in ELA. Here's our yeah. third graders did in math, and but we um, we chose not to do that this year, which is kind of. 
chose to, it because the SBAC scores are so interesting um, and different this year. So uh, in future years, we could aggregate our groups that way, possibly, depending on the number of kids. SBAC data or SBAC data. Um, I think Ahmad has other hand up for us. Good. Yeah, I I have a question regarding so <clears throat> if you have that data, how do we so just like thinking of vision and moving the district forward with policies and like thinking of budgets and not you cannot share that data, but you know there are some there I'm, I'm making this up this assumption that there are some disparities uh, on data that we cannot access. So how do, how do how, what is the best way for us to be able to understand that that is happening? So we know low-income students are facing disparities with COVID, national trends, statewide trends, and I am assuming um, our own trends as well. But I, I'm just like thinking how to make responsible decisions, like how do we support it? How do we understand? That's one question that I have. And then <clears throat> thinking of the, the looking at disciplinary exclusion, did you say that you didn't collect that data or that there was nobody suspended or expelled last year? Had a really excellent year. Um, everybody reported that because of the pod system that we had in schools, the discipline incidents were way down. We also had a significant portion of our population that was virtual and not in the buildings. So it was decreased class sizes in many cases. And not, not saying it was great, but it was kind of this interesting side effect of the COVID situation. We we took note of, so what worked about that? You know, like at the elementary school, for example, they noted that there was there were significantly fewer transitions for students, and so we held on to that little gem and said, okay, how can we how can we use that? So we just didn't we didn't have a ton of disciplinary issues last year. <laughs> we're making up last year. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. Last year. Hopefully. And so the, the question that I am trying to juggle it with these numbers is, if this equity index is looking at the difference between students who have been historically marginalized and their in relation to their peers. So is this, so that's what this is giving us? There, that's, or is this the overall climate, for example? I'm, I'm very confused. It's supposed to give us the difference between the two groups okay. across the academic domain. This year for this snapshot, it's not mathematically possible to do it based on the data that they have. Okay. That's and and uh, and they get this information from us. So like, they're they're getting it from SBAC results and things like that. And you'll notice on the slide where it said student surveys and staff surveys, they didn't do that. So they, they didn't collect that information. And I think, I think Libby and I've heard about these mystery surveys for four years running now. We still haven't seen them. Um, so they, they just based it on state collected assessments um, and expulsion rates. That's, that's what it was based on this year. I think their ultimate design is to be more inclusive of other data sources, but they're just not there yet. And do we collect other data? Yes, but like what? I don't know. The, what <laughs> what data? Are, because I know you're working on data systems right now. So I, I, what kind of data are we collecting systematically? And when so, would that give us a picture at some point? Yeah, so what we're looking at for next year is really rounding up our common local assessments. So assessments that are given commonly across grade levels or content areas so that we can have access to that data um, diagnostic assessments, so things like the F&P, we're looking at collecting those into a place where we can really access them. That's where we can get more valuable information about students' reading. Um, benchmark assessments that we have in various units and things like this. It was a huge task that the, the teachers did this year through the curriculum committees, and they did an amazing job. So we've got this complete list of assessments when we give them, if they're common across grade levels or content teams. And then I'm going to take that this summer 
and put that into our uh, academic data system so that we have places to put that information through next year so that it's finally accessible across areas. And we can take a student and look at their progress in F&P, SBAC, RENSTAR, local assessments, um, word recognition, whatever it is, we can go through and we can see a full profile of a student in one spot. So that's kind of our goal for, for next year is the local assessment component. And then we're also working on um, systems to make that really accessible to school leadership teams so that they don't have to become uh, spreadsheet geeks like myself to be able to understand it. They can go, they can ask a good, a high quality data driven question and we can provide access to that data for them. So we're doing, a, we're doing a lot of that work. I have a, um, oh, go ahead. Um, I was just wondering, is, um, is there a place we can get the actual data rather than the picture? Of the, the yes. Uh, <laughs> on the, yeah, we can, we can send you the snapshot link. It's on the Vermont Agency of Education website. Okay, and they have the, the yeah. do they have the form? There's an out? interactive snap, uh, snapshot view that you can go into and you can look at each school and you can do those things. Do they have the, the actual data? Like, oh, it's 3.75 and not a no. circle with the hole in it. Yeah, so the public view is only the circle with the hole in it. Okay. Um, the administrative side, so they sent to data managers. I'm gonna say this without being snarky. One week prior to publicizing the snapshot, they sent an email out to us that said, please check all this data make sure it's okay one week prior actually yeah, our four schools three of our principals names were wrong <laughs> so <laughs> so so we got we had access to the to the raw data but it was just this it was a massive file um that I mean, if you could pick out what was wrong with it it would, it would be amazing so no, the public only has access to the circles as we get our goal though as we get as as the data programmatically means more last year it wasn't given two years ago last year we can take it with a grain of salt um then we'll we'll be presenting that to the board um, we did it four years ago when when the data becomes available to us and available to the public the challenge one of the challenges is that we get it a year after kids take it so how usable is that information it's only usable for programmatic measures truly when we get it that late well, the aspect this year was embargo, so just two, two or three weeks ago. So we couldn't do anything with the data. We couldn't share it with anybody until two or three weeks ago. That's this, right? The, yeah. Yeah. From yeah. last year. Yeah. And that's typical, a one year. Person. It was a little longer this year. It was year. a little longer than usual this year. I think yeah. it was because of the snapshot. I think they were waiting to get the snapshot ironed out. So then they could produce the embargo information. Shot. Snap shot. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I have a follow-up on, on the climate survey, which is that you know we are about to send one to our faculty, but it sounds like what that's not they wouldn't use that. No. They would have their own. Yes. Oh, good. Yeah. Great. Yep. Uh, to try to get it one last question. Um, let's have Rep go. Um, well, you know, I've heard a lot. I've heard from Eric, I think I've heard from the, from maybe even in this room, the SPAC is not, it's a flawed assessment measure. And a lot of what you guys are doing is really driving in a better culture for assessment, a better set of assessments, and a better, and a better way to collect your data and organize it. So is the intention to create your own snapshot or would it be in a bad, would it be a bad idea to sort of hold up the data that you've got from local assessments next to the, this very shallow, I think probably sort of look at how we're doing. Would that make this look bad? I mean, I think that the goal is to get to a much more specific level than what this is doing. And I oh, think yeah, that yeah. that work is happening. Will that will that information come to the board? Will it, yeah. how might it come to the public? So, the board? so a couple of things. The I wouldn't call the aspect a flawed assessment. I would I would say that you have to use it for what it's 
for what its intended purpose is. Yeah, exactly. It's a programmatic measure, right? So it's a way we can compare how our students are doing across the state. It's a way for us to dig into the domains in literacy and say where informational reading, for instance, our kids don't do as well in informational reading as they do in fictional reading. You know, like they're bigger programmatic things that we can take a look at. Um, obviously our literacy scores are much higher than they are traditionally, not just last year, than our math scores, which is why we've done a lot of professional development around math um, and, and gotten math interventionist. So like there's, there's some reasons for it, you know? Um, but yes, it's, it's also one way to say, well, look, our third grade teachers are reporting that 95% of their kids are proficient on the F and P, which is a diagnostic literacy exam. Yet they're scoring uh, Fountas and Pinnell. Yeah, Fountas and Pinnell. Sorry. Um, Everybody knows that movie. <laughs> you don't know that? Everybody knows that. Everybody knows that. Um, so if they're reporting that 95% of our kids are proficient, you know, and yet this isn't happening, but 20% are proficient on the aspect, that's a question to ask. Like, why, why is that happening? Um, and what other data can we look at to, to triangulate that, to, to get a better question at it? Like Mike and I can geek out on these kind of questions forever. Um, so, but yes, the, the answer though, is that we want a, a truly, excuse me, well-rounded assessment system where we can look at kids and make very targeted goals for kids to move them along in their growth, you know, and, and that everybody has access to the data. Right now, if I said the UES or RVS for that matter, I, or if I went and said, I need to know their, their F and P scores, I'd say, Mike, how do I get the F and P scores? And he'd say, well, Right out there. <laughs> you got maybe we can get it from a principal and they'd send they'd share with me four different google sh sheets you know like it's just not i should have that at my fingertips so that's some of the difficulty that we're having right now so as a follow-up we had a lot of uh, groups of students that may not meet that 11 that threshold of 11 and how do we how do we work with that data and how do we look at that data as a board as from that from a from not a 30,000 feet but from a 10,000 feet say through this this venue is there a way to sort of make any of make find any trends when we don't when we, I'm thinking of here and I'm thinking of our BIPOC community I'm just thinking of different groups that there's not a big enough group to have a generalized say of how the trends are going is there any thought into how that, how we might figure out how to communicate how things are going for small groups? Because we have a lot of small groups. Yeah, I, I think there is. Um, you know, one of the, the distinctions is what can we publicly report and how can we publicly report it? Which doesn't mean that Libby and I can't come to you and say, here's the trend that we're seeing in this population. Here's what we're doing to, to deal with it. But it may mean we can't show you a bar graph at the grade level because it would be too identifiable for that student. You know what I mean? So we can tell the story of the data, and that's that's our goal. And are any of you spreadsheet fanatics? Anyone? Slightly? Anyone? Yeah, yeah, spreadsheet. Yeah, yeah. So we are trying, one of the things that we're working on is to use Google Data Studio to present dashboards of this information because everything basically boils down to a spreadsheet. All this data boils down to a spreadsheet. But when you're meeting with your leadership team as an administrator, you don't want to look at a spreadsheet. You want an interactive visual that gives you the information that you need to have a conversation and spark some conversation. So we're working on dumping these things into Google Data Studio, which creates this dashboard that's interactive. And we see some great examples from other schools that they've used that can even be on the public page um, that show your demographic trends with n size larger or, um, number of snow days or what, whatever it is, it can track anything. So we're working on building our own version of that for next year to make data more accessible. I've kind of made this commitment within myself after a decade of trying to train people how to use data systems, I'm gonna stop doing that. I'm gonna get them the data instead and train them how to ask good data questions. So that's, that's my, my plug there. Um, I've spent over 15 years training people how to use VCAT and I'm just not gonna do that anymore. 
Um, I had one last question, Jim. Um, is there a way to use uh, or look at the trend of the civil rights data uh, since we have that for these districts through, you know, like 2017 is the last one. We'll be able to say, okay, in the past three years, I'll give the example of like the exclusion of, bi of black students uh, that we had in 2011. And so how, like getting at making that system better and saying, look, this, the disparities that we did have with students with disabilities not graduating. So can we look at that to get better knowing that we do have some of that data? Yeah, I, I think we can. The CRDC data upload was, was a nightmare. I won't lie to you about that. That was a super pill. Um, but we're doing it again next year. So this is the first year that they've ever done it in two consecutive years because they delayed it one year because of COVID. So we'll have two years back to back of CRDC data. I'm not sure what else will come out of it. Um, it does have, it, it, it measures a lot of the same data, uh, expulsions, um, but it does look more at our programmatic, like it, it looks at number of courses in mathematics specific to algebra one, algebra two, and it takes all of those things. I don't know that there's a summary report yet for this year's submission, um, but I think that that will be interesting to see two years back to back and what comes from it. It's a very complete set of data. Thank you. Um, so you kind of touched on it a little bit, but I, I just want to kind of get firm on, on what the answer is. So the um, for, from slide four, the climate surveys, the staff and the student climate surveys, um, how long has the Agency of Education been doing this particular data collection process? Yeah, maybe five or six years. Yeah. And have and are you saying they have never done the, right. the climate Correct. surveys for right. either students or staff? Right? That's right. Okay. And is the data available for previous years for these other measures? Some. On the website? Some. Okay. And any and any sort of like explanation of like we've been collecting this data for five years. There's supposed to be these three data points for us to, to determine health and safety schools, but we haven't been doing two of them for the last six years. We Welcome plan to. to very, very valid questions. Um, no, no I, I think I have good faith that they are trying to make a very useful tool and have met many obstacles along the way. I believe that the vendor that supports the snapshot was changed three times over the last several years. So that's, that's an obstacle. Um, and I believe that there were teams within the AOE who were responsible for the snapshot that have changed multiple times um, with turnover. And I believe in the first three years, the data they collected was extremely limited, even more so than today, what I, what I showed you today. I think it was just SPAC. We didn't have the Vermont Science Assessment until three years ago, so that didn't exist. Um, we've never seen the surveys. I don't think they were collecting graduation data, post-graduation data, prior to the last couple of years. Right. So I, I think there's a lot of questions, and I think that's why the AOE said, you know what, we're going to really unpack the, the uh, snapshot with curriculum directors and superintendents next year. That's we have these things every week now, coffee and conversations with the Agency of Education, where they go over information that's relevant. Um, and now they're going to rotate in, work on the snapshot so that we can all understand it. Yeah, because it does feel, I mean, it sort of goes back to Kristen's point about like, why is it even being reported, at sure, least in this, the, in this sort of like view yeah. um, and language like, safe and healthy schools really only boils down to this one data point that i mean it just feels misleading if a pu if and not user friendly like if you the know, public was trying to look at this Emma, and that's why we wanted to like when it became public should anybody find mm -hmm. this right um and i know the aoe has downplayed it this year so not a huge press release and all that kind of stuff although i just heard it on 
Yeah. yeah, but we wanted to make sure you get asked questions like this, right? So we wanted to make sure that, it, you know, it's it's nothing to hide about, but we wanted to make sure that you all could talk talk to it. You know, like when somebody says something about safe and healthy schools, you can say, well, actually, it's not really a reliable measure, you know, because ding, ding, ding. But we are exceeding. <laughs> yeah. Right. But the green and red checkpoints, that was a graphic that you added to this yes. stage. Yes. So that is helpful. Yeah. Thank you for that. You're welcome. <laughs> he was very proud of himself when he I was very proud. He pulled that together. I'm also proud. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I have, I have one more question from the um, where do we go from here slide. Um, they, all the things on that list look excellent to me. And I'm curious just for any examples of what you're thinking about when what what increasing student voice looks like yeah so i think we've had a lot of success with our affinity spaces and we're looking at increasing that work um, at the middle school in particular next year uh, we have increased student voice sitting right here and online yeah. that has just been amazing you know um, they're meeting with me on a regular basis we're having conversations about how we can continue to do that and collect really good data from students uh, so I think we've got a lot of ways that we're looking to do that. And I think right now we're having, we're having more conversations about how do we take these, instead of um, three administrators sitting in a room trying to figure out how to do that, how do we take that conversation to students and say, how, how do we do this? You know, so I've seen that actively happen actually today. That, that just happened. So I think we're in a really good track to figure that out um, and get some more information. I personally am looking at um, some systems for uh, more benchmarking around SEL components, like how are our students doing? We hear a lot from vocal students. I'm also worried about the kids that don't talk, yeah. like what is going on? So finding out ways that we can collect that data. And then affinity spaces at the middle school, just because I don't know, is, is that just affinity uh, that I am a student or is it an affinity based on another identity I might hold? another identity so maybe there's like a queer student affinity space and a okay cool thanks so much mike this was super yeah important. thank you very much thanks mike you did presentation notes <laughs> yes yes any progress, any progress. Yeah. it's gonna be awesome <laughs> Um, Superintendent Evaluation Committee update is our last and final item. Mia? Yeah. Just kidding. I it's going to be able to talk to 40 <laughs> minutes. Kidding. I think this will actually be pretty quick. The um, And largely because I made the mistake of not sending you all the evaluation before the meeting, which I'm happy to send after the meeting, but the update is that it's very near finished. We have a meeting, we're trying to schedule a meeting with Libby for um, early next week to work out just like some very final details around one question or sort of competency that we want to measure um, actually having to do with data, um, bringing it back to our conversation from tonight. And um, just the uh, uh, dissemination of the survey. So. Let me back up a little bit because we do have some new board members and we might have community members watching who aren't um, familiar with this. The board conducts um, an evaluation of Libby or any superintendent every year. And as part of that, Libby does her own self-assessment and she shares the evaluation tool with um, I think 14 staff, basically her direct reports and um, central office staff. And we compile all of that into essentially a summary of these are the places that Libby is really strong at and um, demonstrating strength and here are you know, areas for growth and then set goals around that. So that's the whole purpose of the evaluation tool. Um, and it is um, kind of like the Snapchat and it has been an evolving one over the last three years. And the committee took some time this um, past year to do some updates to it um, the biggest ones were we shifted the timeline so that it lined up more with the school year and we um, 
added some self-reflection questions or reflection questions around what demonstrates strength and what demonstrates room for growth. And we tried to tweak the competencies themselves so that the language of them was um, oriented more toward um, these are the outcomes that Libby is going for as our superintendent, rather than these are some tasks that we are asking of her to do. Um, so those are the updates that we have made. And like I said, I'll share the actual, I mean, you all have access to it. It's a shared Google doc right now, but I will resend the link so you can actually look at that and process that, you know, and not just have to hear it and try and internalize it. Um, but yeah, we're very close to finishing it. And then we will actually do the evaluation almost on schedule to, for the new timeline. Yeah, just a reminder, I know that a lot of this work happens in the, the committee and thanks to all the committee members, social media for really doing a great job covering it this year. But but as a board function, superintendent evaluation and overview is probably a top three, three one. So this is, you know, we, uh, you know, fortunately it's made pretty easy on us because we have a great superintendent, but oh, um, but it is it is definitely something, yeah you know, that, is one of the, the bigger responsibilities the board has is to make sure that the superintendent is you know, doing her job and fulfilling the expectations. Um, and uh, so, you know, they take this work very seriously. And just to take that point a little bit further, you will also see this when I share the link, but you'll see in the timeline that the committee, as Jim said, the committee kind of holds the process and at points when we're ready, takes brings it to the yeah. board. So the board certainly you know, the committee doesn't do all of it. That is, there are points at which the board actually engages yeah, exactly. as a full board yeah. and not just delegated to the committee. Uh, any questions? Um, thank you, Mia. Uh, thank you for not taking 40 minutes. Uh, uh, motion to adjourn. Okay. Can I make a motion to adjourn? Yes. Oh. We'll take that as a second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Great. You feel better, Amanda. Thank you. Thank you.